Good morning, church. Good morning. Nice to be here this morning. Nice to have my grandkids with me, some of them. Well, actually only two of them, but uh, it's a good start. And it's nice to see my brother and family and Jade. Hi, Jade. Yeah. I want to talk to you today about a letter that was sent to the church. And sometimes letters aren't all good. The letter of 1 Corinthians is one of those letters. Sometimes things just have to be dealt with. And if you're not there in person, one of the ways that it could be done is they send a letter. Or write a book or whatever. It became a book, but it was started as a letter. 1 Corinthians, Paul starts out, obviously, with his letter as a greeting. You know, how are you? I'm fine. Things like that. Moves on into... The centrality of the cross, that's a very important, he just felt it was so important to nail that down. I've chose to, to preach among you nothing but Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. Then he moves on explaining his call to the apostleship, to the role of why he's there, why he has the authority to speak to this church the way he needs to. And then he goes on into some of the problems that are in the Corinthian church the immorality that they needed to deal with, uh, marriage or being single and several issues along that, whether the hair should be long or short, uh, food, especially food offered to idols and how to deal with that issue as well. And then he comes to the issue that we're going to talk about today, and that is communion. In, Roman, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about this communion service. Now, communion is one of only two ordinances handed to us by Jesus given to the, two, the New Testament church. The first is baptism, and the second is communion, or what we call the Lord's Supper. And I'm grateful that we're not, you know, have a bunch of feast days and don't have to kill animals and all. I'm really grateful for that, that Jesus didn't come and abolish those. He came and fulfilled those. And now we move on. The New Testament church is not the priesthood brought forward. It is a breakthrough. It's now the priesthood of all believers. If you don't have to be an Israelite. The, the gospel goes to the entire world, Jew or Gentile. None of that matters now. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ, and you can come to him personally. You don't need a priest between you to do that. I'm really grateful for this message that's given us. But then Paul has, the Corinthian church apparently has had some issues with how communion is conducted. And starting 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 17, he says, now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. In other words, this isn't a commendation, this is a correction. And so he's, and that's the good way to do it. If you've ever learned this, and you will learn this if you have children, hopefully, or if you have employees, uh, or even people you work with, you don't come up to them and say, oh, you're doing a really good job and I really like this about you, but it won't work. It won't work because from then on, whenever you go to, to come and, come and, come and commend them, what are they waiting for? The but. the but, yeah. So if you have an issue with someone, state it up front. Look, I need to talk to you about communion, and it's not to praise you, okay? This is a correction, okay? And that way, they're not... Then, when you're done, you can end with the commendation that in spite of everything you've been doing wrong, man, this church is growing, this has got some good... And you can, you can give the praise at the end. But if there's a correction to be made, start with it. Verse 18... For the first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. Would that surprise anybody here today? To learn that there were some divisions in the church? No, I think, in fact, as I contemplate our church structure, I've often wondered how we have unions here and then we have divisions here. I mean, isn't that fighting against one another, the union versus the division? But uh, that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about little groups who... They see it a little differently, and because they see it differently, there's, you can feel the attitude, right? And there's this t 
tension in the air. And he goes on to call it factions. Uh, he says, there must be also be factions among you. And then there's a the group, those who are approved may be recognized among you. You ever, you ever known someone that they needed to be recognized? Yeah. I did it, I did it, I did it, I did it. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's something they're going to have to deal with. But it's Paul is calling it, calling it out for what it is. Do not do your works to be seen among men. In fact, Jesus teaches us that when we do our good works among men, they will give praise to who? To God. Yeah. That they will praise your Father in heaven. When, when you do something really right for God, you don't get the praise. He does. And that's, that's really one of, and you know, we make the mistake often when we, someone has done that and it went off and God got the praise, but then we say, and we want to give thanks to brother so-and-so for what he did there. You know what we're doing? We're pulling their reward back down out of heaven and handing it to them. First, leave it in heaven. Leave it, just thank them for being faithful and loyal and doing what they, and, and move on. So many times we call attention to things that need to be just left alone and the glory goes to God. Amen. Verse 20, therefore when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. This is such a mess that Paul doesn't even want to call it communion. He says, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry and another is drunk. Yeah. What a, what a mixed up hodgepodge. And you know what? The, the, the word that comes to me right here is disrespectful. Disrespectful. When, when you are part of a group and the group has made their guidelines, we should respect that. If you're, if you're in the home of a Jehovah's Witness, it's totally appropriate to use the word Jehovah. If you're visiting a group of the, what we call the sacred name, it's perfectly fine to say Yahshua or Yahweh. Just be respectful of the group that you're with. And these people are not doing that. They're being very disrespectful. In fact, Verse 22, he says, what, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or, and then he uses this word, or do you despise? That's, a, that's the word, that's the disrespect. Do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Now, there's, there are people who didn't, they, they didn't have anything to contribute to fellowship meal. So they're there anyway, and apparently somebody said, now those who brought food can go through line first, and if there's any left over. Can you imagine doing that? Yeah. Despise. That's disrespect. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Paul wants to be clear. This is a rebuke. Now we're going to skip 23, 24, 25, 26. We're going to come back to those four verses when we do the Lord's Supper here. Because these are the instruction on how we should do it. But continuing on in verse 27 there, with his, with his uh, discipline, shall we say, correction. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. When he says be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, what does he mean? It means what he's saying is that you crucified Christ. You're the one. You're the one that hammered the nails. You're the one that stood the pole on in and dropped it into that hole. You're guilty of that. Now, I know Christ died for our sins. We're all grateful that he did that for us. But man, we don't want to be the one, do you, that actually did the deed? And if we do this in an unworthy manner, so I think it behooves us to see what unworthy means, don't you? I mean, let's, we're told that we should be able to walk worthy. 
so unworthy. And verse 28 gives us that very thing. Let a man examine himself. Examine who? Oh, it's so easy for me to see what's wrong with you. Yeah, but that's not what it says, is it? It says examine himself. And so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Every, every, in this study this week, every time I'd come across that unworthy, one of those attributes, the truth of the matter is, I did it to myself. I'm, I'm standing in an unworthy state because of something I did. I'm, I'm not in that unworthy state because of the family I was born into or I didn't have any money or any of those other things, those outside. The unworthiness comes from decisions I have made to place myself in that unworthy position. And there's consequences. Verse 30 says, for this reason, and that's decisions you've made, putting you in this unworthy position. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. When he says sleep, what does he mean? Die. They're dead. Yeah. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, again, emphasis on, uh, you know, don't worry about that speck in your brother's eye. We would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. As if we, because then we wouldn't be in the unworthy manner, right? We would, we would know how to, to straighten up, confess our sins, be forgiven, and stand worthy. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. The, I mean, the Lord, he doesn't correct you just on your way to hell. He corrects you so you don't go to hell, okay? And the, the, the chastening of the Lord is for your own good. It's instruction on how to live in a worthy manner, not unworthy. And chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. The world is going to hell, with or without a handbasket, okay? But uh, therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Be respectful. Be compassionate. And if anyone's hungry, you know, let him eat at home. This isn't, this isn't about the meal. This is symbols and tokens of what Jesus did for us. The body and blood of Christ represented here figuratively, not literally, but figuratively, by the bread. Jesus is the bread of life. By the blood, by the juice, which was poured out for us. And then he ends by saying... That's enough for this letter. I'll deal with the rest when I get there. <laughs> and I'm sure he does. Unfortunately, we have a second Corinthians to follow. Uh, but that's okay. We'll deal with that at another time. To partake in an unworthy manner seems to have three parts to it. One is this callous disregard for others in the body of Christ. Well, I'm not worried about what you, you know, I got mine. I'm good, you know, it's just disregard. And another thing is an attempt to, com and in the Corinthian issue especially, an attempt to combine participation at pagan feasts with participation at the Lord's table. Okay, they're trying, that, that's the way they ate down at the temple. It was this big gorge on all the food and, and apparently some people were trying to bring that to the church and uh, call it fellowship meal but you know you get to be temperate in your own you know it doesn't matter if that dessert table is over there loaded with sugar and you know it's bad for you you don't have to take one <laughs> but don't try and combine this world or at pagan or whatever word you want to put on it and bring it into the church. And number three, this flippant disregard for what the elements represent. This is not just bread. This is not just grape juice. This is a representation of 
what Jesus did for us. As often as you eat this bread and drink this juice, do this, he says, in remembrance of me. Now we're gonna give you that opportunity and here's what I want you to know. Seventh-day Adventist Church practices open communion. Anybody can participate in communion. You don't have to be a member here. Uh, your age, if you're too, you know, your parents will tell you when you're old enough, but the church doesn't do that. What we do try to do is follow the example Christ gave in the upper room. And in the upper room, he took the time out to serve his disciples before they sat back down and participated with the bread and the juice. And he did that by washing their feet. And then he said to his disciples, I've done this for you, you should do this for each other. And what we find is that this, this, this service symbol uh, has come to be called the ordinance of humility. Now it's not about just embarrassing somebody. It really is about you examining yourself to say, where's my pride in regards to what I will do for Christ? Probably my favorite story of this is in the Old Testament. There was a Syrian general named Naaman, and he had leprosy. And he, came, he heard from a little slave girl he'd captured uh, that the prophet in Israel could heal him of his leprosy. So he got the king's permission. He loaded up the chariots with some nice rewards for, and went over to see the, the king. The king didn't know what to do. And Elijah said, you know, send him over here. And uh, he sends out instructions for him. Go wash in the river seven times. Did Naaman want to do that? Why? His pride, his pride was in the way. And the question that his men carefully ask him, are you going to let your pride keep you from being healed? You know, there's, there's been so many times ships have collided with one another because the pride of the captain refusing to yield. I mean, really, are you gonna let your pride keep you from eternity? Are you gonna let your pride keep you from doing what you know to do that's right? So the opportunity, and here's the good, really good news. This symbol, of washing the feet as he gets to Peter. Peter doesn't want him to wash his feet. And Jesus explains a little bit what the symbol means. You've already been baptized. This is just a washing away of those sins that have come on since the last time we did this or since you were baptized. You've already been baptized. You don't need to be re-baptized every time you slip up. But occasionally, every now and then, let's symbolically wash away those sins. And we do that by serving one another and washing each other's feet. Now, if this is really just too strange for you, you're welcome to just stay seated right here in the sanctuary. Ruby's gonna play some music uh, while we go in the other room and practice this ordinance of humility. Now, also, if you've never seen it before, you wanna just come along and look, watch, you're welcome to do that as well. And if you are brave enough and you've never done it before, but you say, I, I'll participate in that, I can put my pride away because this service is what puts us in a worthy state to come back and participate with the bread and the juice. This is where we say, Father, my pride, my selfishness, my disrespect, please take it all away, wash it all away so that I can set at the table in a worthy manner. Amen. And we're going to give you that opportunity to do that. When we come back, there's some white ribbons on the, on the end of the pews. If we would set in those pews that have a white ribbon, it'll make it much easier for the deacons to pass the bread and the juice to us to serve when we come back in. So at this time, we're going to have prayer and we'll separate. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, 
strange some of these things seem to us. But the more we study, the more we realize there's a great little object lesson there in every one of them. Lord, help us not to just disrespect it. Help us not just to put it down as archaic, but to really understand the benefit that's derived for us just saying every time we can, yes, Lord. Lord, be with us, be with everyone in this room today as we participate in this service. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.